just to note. Right. Um, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, comrades, uh, scholars, academics. Uh, thank you for joining us, uh, the Institute for Global Dialogue, um, and this uh, very important uh, discussion about um, the international relations function of the African National Congress. Um, you few rules, uh, housekeeping rules. The, you can use the questions and answers you know, function, uh, the, the chat functions you know, to raise you know, uh, questions and uh, you know, uh, make comments uh, that uh, the panelists will be you know, able to, to, to respond to. Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Pilani Mtembu, the di Executive Director of uh, the Institute for Global Dialogue. Uh, he will give us uh, the broad overview uh, of uh, the purpose of this uh, particular dialogue, um, its uh, importance, its relevance, um, and what it is exactly that uh, the Institute for Global Dialogue is going to uh, be doing, uh, what it intends to achieve. Uh, on the panel, we've got um, very uh, seasoned you know, and experienced internationalists uh, joining us today to discuss uh, this uh, important matter on the birthday of uh, or Tambo. Uh, we've got uh, Ubabuma Vusom Simang, a veteran you know, uh, of the African National Congress you know, and an internationalist. Uh, we have uh, U Comrade Reneva Fori from the Af SACCP, South African Communist Party, uh, and experienced internationalist. Uh, we have uh, U Comrade Bongani uh, Masuku from um, the Congress of South African Trade Unions, an experienced uh, uh, internationalist. And we have uh, our ambassador Willie Lentrap, our discussant, um, who will you know be uh, leading this uh, a discussion. Each uh, speaker will be getting about ten minutes uh, to 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 address us. I'll hand over to to Dr. Mtembu uh, to 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 begin. Dr. Mtembu. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mika, and uh, thank you, colleagues. Um, I really have to first say uh, thank you for, uh, first, just to the panelists for, for making the time available uh, this morning. I know there's a number of uh, challenges with connectivity, um, different load shedding in different areas, but there is also elections, and this is a difficult time given that we are just a few days away from our local election. So I must really extend and, and say thank you so much for making time available uh, this morning. I think the importance uh, colleagues and what I will really do because we've, I think we've got a really great um, sort of lineup of, 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 of speakers uh, on the panel. And what I will do is really just expand a little bit on the concept note uh, that was shared. Uh, essentially, what we are doing today is using the birthday celebration of uh, O.R. Tambo, um, longest serving president of the ANC, and really somebody who spearheaded uh, the ANC's international uh, relations and spearheaded the ANC's external mission. And what we'll be doing is really reflecting on the legacy of uh, the late O.R. Tambo, but also using it as a way of also um, reflecting a little bit on the ANC's international relations, reflecting on what impact the legacy of Tambo has had on the ANC's orientation. Uh, towards international uh, relations. And uh, we have a few speakers and, and, and a, a respondent who will touch exactly on those areas. My key task is to just firstly lay, give a, 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 an overview on the theme and on the topic and why it is important. The first point is why it was important in terms of the establishment of the ANC's external mission. Um, following the banning of the ANC after the Sharpeville massacre in 1960, 
the struggle against apartheid would essentially evolve and essentially be anchored on four pillars, namely mass mobilization, armed operations uh, through Umkonto Esizwe, underground organization, and international solidarity work. One cannot understand the historic significance of international relations to the ANC during this period without an appreciation of the role that was played by Owar Tambo. Definitely one of the greatest statesmen of the 20th century and the longest serving president of the ANC. He stood out as a leader in the midst of the Cold War for his ability to engage all, the Western allies, the East, um, the North and the South, and still be considered as the legitimate leader of the peoples of South Africa. He sought solidarity without seeking to be told what or where the future of his people lies. He was regarded as an exiled head of state by many, especially the frontline states. Indeed, as young activists in the 1940, in the 1940s, <laughs> uh, Tambo, Mandela, and Sisulu um, had already made a significant contribution in moving the ANC from what uh, the late Chris Hani terms, the politics of a smile protest uh, to the politics of challenge. The energy that they injected into the ANC was at an important time given the then challenges facing the movement. However, in terms of the international relations of the ANC, assuming greater responsibilities within the struggle against apartheid, it was the Sharpeville massacre of 21 March 1960 uh, that would force the international relations and solidarity pillar to become one of the most important in the struggle against apartheid. With the movement banned, a standing order of the ANC NEC came into effect, which stated that if the Congress movement were to be banned, Tambo was to go into exile and establish the ANC external mission. He was thus snuck out of the country to the then Botswana land uh, before making his way to the UK. This was an extremely important task given that the ANC and its structures were being crushed at home, which was exemplified in the Rivonia trial of 1962, which saw virtually the entire leadership of the ANC arrested and detained, placing even greater pressure on the international relations and solidarity pillar in sustaining the struggle against apartheid and shining a light on abuses at home. Or Tambo and some of the first movers um, or pathfinders as they have also been referred had to endure various hardships and uncertainty given the lack of resources and basics to sustain their lives and that of their families. Um, and fellow comrades in exile. They would thus depend on international solidarity and building relations and support structures in order to sustain their work. In the immediate aftermath of the Sharpful massacre, Tambo emphasized much of his delibera deliberations in Europe on the need to acknowledge the humanity of the majority, whilst explaining who the ANC was, what its policies were, and railing the world behind the idea of sanctions, which at the time was not a popular idea amongst countries with an influence in South Africa, especially those in the West. The ANC would go on to set up various offices of chief representatives in countries that Tambo had established relations with, and they essentially represented the ANC in exile, outlining the views and positions of the movement and its vision for a democratic South Africa, and that of a fairer, more equitable and just globe. They also mobilized resources to sustain the other three pillars of the struggle against apartheid, while encouraging the governments, peoples and enterprises of various countries to not invest in or fund the apartheid machinery. Indeed, the number of cheap chief representatives offices would eventually grow 
to approximately 32 in the 1980s, eclipsing the diplomatic footprint of the apartheid regime. While a growing number of countries essentially treated the ANC as the main representatives of the aspirations of South Africans, representing the ANC in those countries was certainly not a task without its dangers, as seen in the assassination of the ANC's chief representative in France, Switzerland and Luxembourg, uh, Dulce September in 1988. Besides the important role played by O.R. Tambo, some of the key figures tasked with leading and coordinating the ANC's Department of International Affairs included the likes of Josiah Jele, Johnny Makatini, and Thabo Mbeki. An impressive list of chief representatives um, would thus play an important role in garnering international support for the anti-apartheid movement in South Africa and abroad. And this was quite important because chief representatives essentially acted as almost your diplomats um, uh, and, 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 and represented the interests of the ANC and the broader uh, struggle against apartheid. And they would mobilize uh, resources, uh, which were also funneled to the other pillars of uh, the ANC. Now, what is also important is that um, the anti-apartheid movement would rise and grow and essentially become a massive uh, a global movement. Um, so you had anti-apartheid movements arising in the UK, in the Netherlands, in Italy, in Australia, and even in West Germany, uh, where the Friedrich Ebert Stiftung, uh, for instance, uh, gave support to the ANC and assisted in establishing its chief representative office in Bonn. This was an early form of people-to-people -people relations and multiple track diplomacy, which also uh, buttressed, was also buttressed by an equally impressive effort in the areas of arts and culture. Uh, for instance, the establishment of the Amandla Cultural Ensemble in 1978 was a significant part of these efforts and demonstrated a powerful use of arts and culture to speak to the hearts and minds of people all over the world, carrying powerful performances while communicating the aspirations of the oppressed people in South Africa. And this was quite important um, because what we see, I think, in the legacy of uh, the ANC's international relations um, and the external mission and the role that was played uh, by the late O.R. Tambo, uh, we saw the ability at the time of the ANC to build quite a credible and to retrain and skill many of its uh, chief representatives. And in countries where the ANC was not able to get official support from those governments, uh, the strategy was to work directly with the peoples of those countries in order to build pressure from below. And I think there's many lessons that we can actually learn from the evolution of the ANC's international relations and lessons that were learned in exile, I think some of those lessons are still relevant for the current uh, ANC and the current ANC international relations as it reflects on its international relations. I think this dialogue, uh, colleagues, comes at a very opportune moment. Besides uh, um, um, coming at the time of uh, O.R. Tambo's birthday and letting us reflect on the legacy of O.R. Tambo himself, I think it allows us also and the current leadership of the ANC to reflect on whether the country has been able to utilize its um, vast network of, 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 of embassies, of uh, people to people ties, um, and whether it has been able to use it in a manner that advances progressive internationalism within the global landscape, and therefore in a manner in which advances a better Africa in a better world. Uh, we're quite privileged uh, this morning that we are joined with um, panelists, uh, speakers, 
and respondents of whom some have had the privilege of actually working uh, directly with the late uh, O.R. Tambo. And with those uh, 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 comments, colleagues, I look very much forward to the discussion um, and would encourage also the attendees uh, to pose their questions using the Q&A function uh, and also the chat function. Um, and, and each of the, the, the panelists will be given roughly 10 minutes um, to give some of their impressions on the topic, on the legacy of Tambo, and a few reflections on the ANC's international relations. But also, we, what is also good about this morning's conversation is that we have speakers from the African National Congress, speakers from the Congress of South African Trade Unions, um, but also from the South African Communist Party and the South African National Civic Organization. Um, and this also will allow us to reflect on the role, not just of the ANC in international relations, but also on the broader alliance movement in ensuring that international relations remains, at the, uh, it remains a central pillar of the program of the ANC, and that also international relations remains an important pillar in also tackling some of the key challenges that South Africa faces uh, domestically. So with that, uh, those opening remarks, colleagues, um, I will open it up now uh, to our panel discussion and invite our first uh, speaker for the morning, uh, Mr. Mavu Somsimang uh, from the African National Congress. Uh, Mr. Msimang, over to you. Well, thank you very much for the invitation to participate in this very, very important uh, session. You've said everything I wanted to say. What more can I say? <laughs> yeah, maybe to recap and expound a little bit, I, I would like to take my um, video off as I requested a little earlier. This is very, very <clears throat> dicey. But the, uh, Thank you. Uh, it's, it, it's, it, it, you've mentioned quite correctly that uh, in, um, a 19, uh, in 1959, the National Executive Committee of the African National Congress, <clears throat> anticipating the banning of the ANC uh, shortly, because that was such, uh, this, the 50s was such a, a militant decade. Um, in the life of the organization. Remember that it started quite early with uh, the defiance campaign, where, which was led by Nelson, <coughs> Nelson Mandela as the chief volunteer, volunteer in chief, he was called. You had the Congress of the People, which saw extensive organization of people across uh, race lines. Important then because uh, apartheid was about segmenting people and even allocating their residential areas based on their um, race, um, uh, their pigmentation and all that crazy thing that was happening at the time. You had uh, the Women's March on Pretoria, you had um, the treason trial, and it was quite clear that uh, sooner than later, the African National Congress was going to be banned. Uh, Tambo was specifically selected to be the person to go abroad and continue the work of the ANC when such a banning occurred. And as the presenter has already indicated, indeed, after the Sharpeville uh, massacre and the banning of the organizations, um, Tambo was uh, on his way out and established himself in London, but not for long because uh, shortly thereafter, Mkonto uh, Wesizwe, having been formed in 1960 in December, uh, was already sending people out. So the task of establish, establishing an ANC presence and its activities abroad was uh, complemented by the essential need to look for um, and cater after the, to the needs of uh, Mkonto Wesizwe. People were living 
in their dozens and eventually in their hundreds to uh, learn how to um, uh, take up arms and fight the struggle in the only manner that was available at the time because the organization had been banned and was no longer allowed to exist. So all Al Tambo found himself quickly having to go to um, uh, Addis Ababa to, um, <clears throat> to meet Nelson Mandela actually, who had gone out to uh, uh, do his own training before coming back to lead uh, Umkonto Wisizu. Suffice to say perhaps that uh, the mission of ORs <clears throat> Uh, resulted uh, in the setting up of a vast network of anti-apartheid uh, movement uh, organizations. Again, across all continents, uh, this was a grassroots organization by and large consisting of uh, the people's movements, what you would call NGOs, there were trade unionists, there were even local governments, such as the Italian one, which recognized ANC and the ANC as representing the aspirations of the people of uh, South Africa. So thanks to OR and a lot of others, but he very much at the head, the anti-apartheid movement became extremely active in taking the interests of the people of South Africa uh, via the vehicle of the African National Congress that still existed, uh, that existed externally. A lot of the work focused quite naturally on isolating, trying to isolate the apartheid government through sanctions, uh, through diplomatic boycotts, through sports boycotts. And believe you me, it got to be very, very effective. It has been said in the introduction here that uh, 30 years on, um, uh, by the time that the ANC was unbanned in 1990, there were some 32 offices of the African National Congress internationally. And quite correctly too, it's been pointed out in the introductory statement that these were almost de facto embassies of South Africa, certainly with uh, many of the countries. Uh, the West, of course, continuously maintained relations, quite duplicitous, I'm sorry, I must use words like that, uh, in um, pretending, in uh, mouthing uh, support for the oppressed people in favor of uh, uh, fighting against oppression and yet doing everything, literally everything to support the apartheid regime because of uh, economic uh, interests. Uh, all our uh, and the ANC <clears throat> focused on the grassroots, but also uh, requested, uh, uh, appealed to uh, Western governments to really take a moral stand against apartheid. Uh, and when at a certain time, uh, the retort from the West was, uh, but you are communists and so on. Uh, he asked them quite bluntly, the only existence we have has been forced on us, which is to have to fight. And we asked you for weapons and you were not quite sure that the violence of the people would be justified against the violence of the state. So those who believed that, uh, uh, and whose only interest was to support what we're doing, did support, um, did uh, provide uh, that kind of military uh, support. Um, um, it, it, it's, it's very clear also that uh, the focus, OR's focus, was that in every organ, international organization, whether it was the United Nations, um, uh, uh, our, the voice of the ANC had to be heard. But regional organizations such as the OAU, uh, now called the AU, we had a very strong presence there before the Liberation Committee attending all meetings of the OAU, their summits, uh, because it was important, all our thoughts, that uh, uh, carefully selected comrades uh, who knew their story should go and represent 
the African National Congress and through them, the interest of the South African people in these councils. So you also had the non-aligned movement uh, where our voice was heard and were recognized and were not, uh, were not formal delegates, but were always <clears throat> allowed to participate in these things. So also was the case with the Afro-Asian solidarity movement. Uh, every uh, organization that had, that had representation that was of interest uh, to us, the, the OR Tambo made sure that we had representation. Uh, the peace uh, mission in Helsinki, I think it was, uh, where Comrade Jela represented us. I mean, everywhere. The point I'm trying to make is that every meaningful organization was important for the ANC to participate in. And we, <clears throat> and, and there was thorough preparation um, uh, and, and, and our voice was heard. We really were no different from any other uh, say organizations which were here, except through the distinction of our presentation, the quality of uh, our, our of the people we represented, and uh, the leader who who led us. Uh, so much having been said in the introductory statement, I would just want to quickly quickly say that in OR we had an extremely gifted person naturally very intelligent. And I usually don't spend too much time on that because uh, he didn't contribute much to that. He was born extremely, I mean, extremely intelligent. The important thing about that is that he used this intelligence in the service of the people right from the early age, protesting at Fort Hare in defense of uh, the kitchen staff, I think, who were being abused uh, by the authorities. Uh, switching from being a very effective, uh, sorry, a very um, powerful mathematician and physics person and going over to uh, study law. And uh, in order to, he said, he said at one time, he, he took up law because uh, apartheid always victimized people who had no jobs. And uh, the, the whole thing about uh, um, you know, I think laws about loitering, not having, not carrying a pass, and so on. These are were, were, were victims whom he thought uh, he, like others, had a role in, um, in in addressing their problems. So, an intelligent person, but also a very humane, a very um, a sensitive a person, sensitive to the the difficulties uh, of uh, the, the, the poor. OR also was a leader on issues of gender. If uh, our parliament today, I uh, don't know if we've still maintained it, uh, is the highest in terms of representation uh, between males and females, we can only thank that entirely to OR's visionary um, with perception of uh, uh, the, the, the role of women in, in disgust uh, with uh, the, their abuse. Uh, a humble man, I must wind up, I'm sure other people will need to talk. He, he, his, he was so modest. When Chief Lutuli died in 1967, uh, Tambo had to act as acting, he was, had, had to become acting president. With the passing of time, it was very difficult to go and delegations and introduce the leader of our delegation as the uh, acting president of the ANC. And suggestion was made that uh, uh, perhaps he agrees the NEC could decide that he becomes a president until such time that things could be sorted out. And he says uh, quite uh, uh, bluntly, well, presidents tend to be elected at conferences and there's no conference uh, that can be convinced, you know, in our exile. Uh, situation that was in the early days. So, uh, uh, but the, the international approach, which is what I think is of interest here, the the rallying call was, he he said a struggle, the struggle 
uh, has a leader, has a represent, representative. They, they, there is always a leader to the struggle. And it decided that um, the, the, it's, our struggle must, must be, must be perf personified in the name of Nelson Mandela. This was after uh, the Rivonia trial. They say, well, yes, yes, we are, we are asking them to support the struggle of the people of South Africa, we are asking everybody to do that. But the, the focus should be to give the struggle, <clears throat> to, to focus support on the, on the freeing of Nelson Mandela and on the political prisoners, our leaders, he would say, in the jails of South Africa. So it became, if you like, Mandela just became so well known internationally, thanks to his own uh, stature and the speech he made uh, at the um, Rivonia trial, at the end of the Rivonia trial, but OR played second fiddle to no one in building up Nelson Mandela as the leader of the struggle uh, of the people of South Africa. So there are many instances, perhaps as we talk here, where one would be able to demonstrate not only his self-facing nature, his humility, uh, but also many other uh, traits that I think uh, uh, we, we have much to, to learn from. I hope at a certain time later, we'll be able to discuss the role of international relations today and compare it with uh, what was happening in the past, even after 1994. It is really important that we check up. Uh, I can't miss the opportunity to say, it's amazing when you hear leaders of the African National Congress actually lend their weight to xenophobia and there is no other word for it, it's xenophobia. It is alien to the African National Congress but we are a little reckless about that. We would not be talking as we are if it hadn't been for international solidarity. Thank you very much. I'll pause it for now. Uh, thank you so much uh, uh, for, for, for those remarks and those reflections. And, and, and I think you, you, you're touching on a very important point that this conversation should force us to reflect on the current role of international relations and, 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 and whether we are still sort of maintaining the progressive internationalist uh, positions, uh, traditional positions of the ANC and where there are events that occur that are contradictory to those values, uh, whether we are actually reacting appropriately enough um, in contemporary times. I think also what strikes me in, in your address is the, well, the humility of uh, uh, Oar Tambo, but also I think the, the credibility of many of the chief representatives, because I think that if many of the chief representatives were not regarded in the countries where they were uh, working, if they were not held in high esteem, um, then they would not have been able to actually deliver uh, their message across. I think also one thing that is also striking is the consistency of the messaging. Uh, so the consistency of the messaging that emanated from OR Tambo, but that also then reflected um, to the various chief representative uh, offices uh, that the ANC uh, had. And just the, the, the capability of the chief representatives, I think it's also noted that many of them, um, you know, even though if some of them would learn on the job, but they were, they, there was always a, 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 a training element that accompanied uh, the various chief representatives. So um, they had the credibility, but they also continued um, to learn and to continue to train, of course, through the international solidarity networks. And I think that is definitely something that um, the current leadership can certainly reflect on. Um, I think also then with, uh, with those uh, remarks, um, it's important to then also note that in the 80s, um, 
um, Oar Tambo and, and his team were sort of laying the groundwork for negotiations. And the 1980s had been declared the decade of liberation um, and the internal and external measures were being ramped up. Uh, South Africa was increasingly being rendered ungovernable and new organizations were arising. Uh, some of these organizations range from youth movements, women's movements, uh, to trade unions. And of course, trade unions have historically played an important role also in international uh, relations. And for some reflections uh, from the perspective of the Congress of South African Trade Unions, uh, I would like to uh, give the floor uh, to Mr. Bongani Masuku for his reflections. Thank you very much, uh, Comrade uh, Dr. Pilani, and uh, greetings to all stalwarts of the movement, veterans, leaders who are present today, scholars, activists, and all who are present here today. I can see even comrades from across uh, the region, Southern Africa, and uh, as activists who are involved. And uh, we are welcome, uh, dear comrades. But anyway, thank you very much to the IGD for having convened this and invited COSAT to participate in this important audience. At a very awkward time, a few days before the, uh, the votings in the local government elections, when everyone's hands are dirty. But anyway, the point, comrade, I will also, because I'm not certain of my network, I would request that as I proceed, if uh, my network becomes a problem, I'm allowed to put off the camera. But the most important thing for now is that uh, Having laid the foundation, Dr. Pilanim Tembu, followed by our stalwart, uh, Babem Simang, it makes my work easier because mine is to just start by acknowledging that the foundation of internationalism that we have seen or that we have lived through, whatever the difficulties and sometimes inconsistencies and sometimes shortfalls, uh, is part of the journey, but the foundation of internationalism that we have experienced or have been able to see has been laid by the work that was done by a generation of men and women who recognize that the frontiers of revolution are not going to be found within one border. There is no human struggle that succeeds or that was meant natural to be in an enclave. So it's very important that we appreciate the experiences and the lessons of profound internationalism. The experiences of what it means to feel the pain of people millions of, or miles away, I'm sorry, miles away, when you are having your own issues or problems wherever you are. It reminds me an ambassador from Jamaica that I met somewhere uh, where there was a, recognition of the contribution of Bob Mardi to the Jamaican uh, comrades. As he was citing the work that OR, that the ANC, that the liberation movement of South Africa, of Africa had done all over the continent, including the Caribbean. She said one of the most profound things. She said, Jamaica is a very poor country like all the other Caribbean countries, but their poverty was no reason not to feel the pain of fellow brothers and sisters in Africa who was suffering the yoke of colonialism, slavery, and apartheid. So the little that they made their contribution of was not because they had lots of money. It was because the recognition was that no human suffering must be allowed anywhere, however much, however little we can put. And I'm also reminded of the experiences of a a comrade from Nigeria when I was in Lagos, who told me that children in schools would line up after the ANC had done much work to be able to raise consciousness about the feeling and the pains of South African Blacks and how students would contribute even in Tanzania, some little funds to be able to build that experience. The comrade was telling me, said, we were talking about Western Sahara and how the internationalism of Western Sahara can learn from the struggle against apartheid. So he said, I didn't know that my five cent was so important, but now I've learned that it was not the money that matters. It was a feeling, it was a shared sentiment, it was a joint struggles that we were waging across. 
So these profound foundations of internationalism are an experience, a lesson, and an inspiration to young generation. We have never been lucky to live with the legends of the status of OR, but we are lucky to feel and to experience and to be inspired by the ideals of OR and the generation that uh, he lived with. With these few words, comrade, I want to be able to indicate that uh, what is important is a few things that uh, we would recognize as COSAT. First and foremost, that the giant and the legacy of uh, OR Tambo helped us to land in a situation where we are part of a revolutionary movement, a movement that recognizes that Africa must be liberated from Cape to Cairo, from north to south, from east to west. So it meant that the struggles of the people of Western Sahara so far away on the other edge of Africa are as close as the struggles of our people inside the country. And this foundation is very profound. And this foundation we must never take for granted. We want to indicate that uh, the African footprint that OR left in many capitals of the continent, sometimes he had to awaken comrades who might not have been alert to the situation in the southern tip of Africa. And you have comrades who will tell you that it was through the interaction and the great humility with which he presented the case that they were able to realize this is not a case about South Africa or geography, which means far away people, it was their own case. So in the same way that the inspiration and impressions were created across the globe, particularly in the global South, comrades, I want to particularly touch on the African footprint and the global South. The establishment of the Nanaline movement in Pandum in 1957 was a watershed moment for the people of Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And it is no small role that the ANC and the movement in South Africa led by OR played a very key role in working together with the rest of the African detachment, the liberation movement of Africa and the fighting forces of Africa. To also join together with Che Guevara and other comrades in Bandung to send a message to imperialism that the world's people who have been regarded as subhumans are no longer going to tolerate or stand by the side while the world continued to belong to a master race. So in that sense, it changed the global balance of power in many ways. And that's why many of us are still hung up in the assumption and hope that something equivalent to the Nanalite movement, to the Pandung movement or Pandung conference will be able to still be born in the world of today that is in motion to be able to retrace the finest, the best, and the most fierce traditions of internationalism and the most profound. Sometimes today we compare, I can only give solidarity because I have, or I'm supposed to have millions before I can give solidarity. Solidarity means sharing the trenches. Solidarity means feeling the pain. Solidarity means we can be able to do it together because your strategy depends on me and my strategy depends on you. Kosatu was born at a time where the brutality of apartheid gave no reason for it to be, to be, to, 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 to be complacent, that's the word I wanted, to be complacent. So Kosatu was born of the tradition of two trade unions, that is Satu and Fosatu. Satu was working with the World Federation of Trade Union largely in, in Eastern Europe and throughout the world. And Fosatu was born of independent trade union that came together to form a, a, a different tradition. But Kosatu was able to be born of the major of the two that recognized that one of the founding pillars of Kosatu or founding principle is international solidarity and internationalism. As I talk today, the Congress of the Zimbabwe Congress of Trade Union is starting today in Harare. And the president of Kosatu, who is also the president of Satu, Comrade Zingi Solosi, will be addressing the Congress, not only about the Zimbabwe problem, but about the dynamics in the region and how we can be able to learn from the frontline states movement, how we can be able to learn from the SADAC, the formation of the SADAC, the first SADAC, that is a, what was it called? Southern African Development Coordinating Community Council, before it was called the SAD, the Development Community, yes. So that was born out of the struggle brought together by the 
great likes of Comrade Kenneth Kaunda, Comrade uh, Robert Mugabe, Comrade Sam Nuyoma, Comrade uh, Samora Michelle, the, the Kwame Nkrumah with, with full support of Kwame Nkrumah, with full support of uh, Julius Nereri, and all of them in the region. But now we are in a different moment. How are we able to posture and position ourselves in this region? This region is in motion and in movement. Someone, uh, or the CC of Kosatu, in fact, to be more specific, uh, someone had said it outside, but the CC of Kosatu specifically explicitly stated, Southern Africa is going through a profound process of change that seen, has, has not been seen since the end of colonialism and apartheid. The shacklings of corruption and abuse of power and sub-imperialist attachments and the uh, other forms of reactionary behavior are being challenged by the people from below. People are beginning to say the struggles that were waged by our great stalwarts and our leaders are the struggles that we must continue. Every generation has a mission, as Fernand said, and it must fulfill it. And this is the role of the generation, not only to get inspiration from prior generation, but to be able to soldier on towards a new Africa. The rebirth of the continent is in motion. Someone said you must never be negative during this moment. We must always be inspired that a new moment is being born in Africa. And thanks to the great legacy of O.R. and Adelaide Tambo and all the stalwarts who laid the foundation. One last point, a chair, without taking much of your time. We want to call on our academics and historians, I know that some of them are already saying, we know what you're going to say. That the history of Africa, the sociology of Africa, the anthropology of Africa, the political science of Africa must reflect the historical evolution, development, and concrete organic experiences of Africa. Can we avoid the fact that we, when you look at African studies, you begin to say, so this is what you learn about African history. And when you walk the continent from Cape to Cairo, you can feel the experiences, the concrete re relation, the concrete situation and evolution of the continent. It's very important that we don't take that history for granted because future generations shall judge us harshly. With these few words, thank you very much, comrades, and all the best to this very important uh, audience and session. Thank you. Thank you very much um, for, for those remarks um, and, and, and also for throwing the challenge there for, for, for scholars and for uh, those who are documenting not only contemporary issues, but who are also reflecting on the past. And to really ask whether, uh, whether it is anchored in the African experience and also in the African uh, interpretation of events. So I think this is quite important, but also what is quite important, I think in, in what you're mentioning is issues of solidarity. Uh, and I've already seen some in, in the comment section where some are saying, what is solidarity in contemporary times? And you, you made mention of the linkages between uh, COSATU and trade unions, for instance, in Zimbabwe, um, but also COSATU um, you know, has, 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 has extensive uh, uh, networks going all, you know, across the African continent, uh, even up to Nigeria and in other countries. And, and I think this is something that is, 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 is an important question in saying, what is solidarity in contemporary times? And, and, and something that you're mentioning is that some would want or wait to have millions before they pledge certain solidarity. But I think if there's something that we're learning from the legacy of Oar Tambo and the evolution of the ANC's international relations is that, uh, is that solidarity showed its way through various mechanisms and through various forms, some of which you have outlined um, uh, during your presentation. So I think a lot of you know, good points for us to reflect on. I think also what's important before we move, uh, for instance, to our, our next speaker, uh, who will reflect on some of the, uh, these matters, but also from the lens of the South African Communist Party. And I think it's quite important to reflect that um, uh, international relations you know, has, has played a, a role going all the way back since the founding 
of the African National Congress. Um, but it's also important, you know, I think before we invite our speaker uh, from COSATU, is to then reflect on that in 1906 uh, at Columbia University, uh, it was uh, Pixley Kaisa um, Kaseme who spoke about the regeneration of Africa in a widely publicized speech that won him much acclaim. Uh, also in 1927, uh, Josiah uh, Tsangana Kumede and James Arnold Lakuma, they also traveled to England uh, before proceeding across Europe uh, to Moscow uh, to get exposure and create linkages with the various progressive movements of the time. Uh, and one must also remember that figures such as Charlotte Marklake had already been to the US from, 1980, uh, from 1895, uh, of course, at Wilberforce University in Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, and working under the likes of W.E.B. E. Uh, du Bois. And um, so, you know, you had a, a lot of this sort of uh, pan-African, but also internationalist uh, thinking um, within, you know, the trade unions, within the Communist Party and within the African National Congress. And with those remarks, let me uh, give the floor uh, to Ms. Uh, Rineva Fouri uh, from the South African Communist Party. Thank you. The floor is yours. Um, good morning, everyone. I bring you warm revolutionary greetings from the South African Communist Party. Please pardon me too if I switch off my camera because the network is a bit unstable where I am. I would... Um, it is indeed a pleasure for us to be participating in this platform today. And we want to congratulate the Institute for Global Dialogue and UNISA for arranging this important and august engagement. Around exactly this time, nine years ago, the ANC hosted its third International Solidarity Conference. At the time, I was leading the African Ministerial Conference on Decentralization and Local Development and Professor Eddie Maloka, who was then the ministerial advisor to DERCO, asked me to coordinate the planning team toward, um, for this event. Um, Comrade Willily was also part of it. Towards the end of the conference, the ANC NEC appointed uh, the late Jackson Tembu to coordinate the day-to-day -day management of the conference, as the team had by then expanded to include a whole range of stakeholders. Now, I will use the ANC's Third International Solidarity Conference to illustrate the historical influential role that the ANC played within the progressive space and to motivate that there is an expectation that it should be continuing to occupy that space, particularly as it is now the governing party. The ANC had never been a socialist organization, but it had always prioritized the improvement of the conditions of the working class and the poor. And it had always championed collective leadership in pursuit of human rights, social economic justice, and the creation of a more equitable and peaceful world. It is these principles that gave the ANC such a high model standing globally, that it was able to mobilize the international community to support an unprecedented comprehensive set of sanctions against the apartheid regime. The ANC's historical popularity among the oppressed nations across the world was earned and it was well-deserved in addition, in addition to the unfailing and bold assertion of its principles, it had an outstanding caliber of leadership, the most notable being comrade Oliver Tambo, as the speakers before me had attested. His vision, humility, and courage endearing to all inside and outside of the country. And so it was under his leadership 
that the ANC's first international solidarity conference took place in Arusha, Tanzania from the 1st to the, to the 4th of December, 1987. And the theme for that conference was, peoples of the world unite against apartheid for a democratic South Africa. More than 60 countries represented by more than 500 delegates gathered to consider the issues of the, of the South African and Namibian struggles against the apartheid regime and to reflect on the regime's ruthless repression and its destructive aggression within the frontline states. The second international conference took place in Johannesburg from 19 to 21 February, 1993. It brought together 900 delegates from about 70 countries across five continents to discuss the contribution of international solidarity on the turn of the tide in South Africa's political landscape. And it was, it was this conference that reflected on the need for South Africa to play the role of a responsible and progressive state force in global affairs, working closely with global South actors. It underlined people-based South-South cooperation. It underscored the role of the solidarity movement in the fight for reform of structures of global governance and international finance in order to give impetus to the fight against global poverty. The third international solidarity conference took place in Swane from 25 to 28 October, 2012, and was themed United for a Progressive Better World. The aim of the conference in line with the legacy of our Tambo was to continue to unite like-minded people globally for peace, solidarity, and social transformation towards creating a world free of human rights abuses and towards the creation of sustainable environments. The third International Solidarity Conference brought together former anti-apartheid movements, former national liberation movements, solidarity groups, NGOs, trade union formations, the religious sector, left formations, community-based organizations, anti-globalization formations, progressive political parties, socialist international, think tanks and academics, regional organizations, international organizations, and eminent persons to discuss how best to restore the hegemonic voice of progressive forces in global political and economic relations. The ANC could successfully conduct these great international solidarity conferences because of its positive reputation. Its reputation and image had created an expectation from progressive peoples, movements, and countries that supported us in our anti apartheid struggle that we would use our power as a governing party to fundamentally and aggressively promote the values and principles that we had espoused as a liberation movement during the times when we were fighting apartheid. To a large extent, we had done this, particularly in our first three terms of government. We champions the overall of the OAU, we championed the establishment of NEPAD, the APRM, and the Pan-African Parliament. We challenged the trajectory of the WTO, the UN, and its organs. Through BRICS, we challenged the Brenton Wood Institution. And we played a leading role in strengthening platforms of international solidarity. So consequently, the ANC, despite how it feels about itself, still maintained its position as a beacon of hope for many oppressed nations. And so it then begs of us to ask ourselves, if we are still optimally asserting that revolutionary obligation that history has bestowed upon us. As Morocco increases its grip on the African Union, as Israel expands its stronghold on countries on our continent, when a host country 
of Amilcar Cabral, the Cape Verde, allows that the Venezuelan, who is busting sanctions that has been illegally opposed on his country, it's, Cape Verde allowed them to be extradited to the USA. Then we have to question our effectiveness as contributors to defending the world's oppressed people. Currently, there's this huge move towards the reparation of Africans for the period of slavery and colonialism. Are we having a strong presence in that movement? Furthermore, when economic interests start superseding revolutionary interest in determining our foreign policy, we need to question if the moral high ground in the past is waning. Are we true to our moral compass? And if yes, have we as the ANC or as the liberation movement within the Department of International Relations and Cooperation yeah, I'm not referring to its political leadership. I think we are extremely fortunate to have a sterling, one could almost say perfect minister and her deputy ministers and advisors. But can we truly say the same about the administration? We dare not allow the legacy of Comrade O. R. Tambo to fade. We owe it to the world at large to remain true to our historic mission, to champion the interests of not just the marginalized in South Africa, but also to continue to champion the interests of all marginalized across the world. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for those remarks. And I think it, 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 it really um, takes us to a very important part of the discussion where we really reflecting on the legacy of Oar Tambo, but also reflecting on the contemporary issues that are faced in government and whether um, the, uh, the ANC and Alliance partners um, have the necessary ability uh, and even capacity to actually um, translate some of those progressive values that are outlined, you know, in statements uh, through policy, but that they are able to also translate that into action uh, within government and to, to use the levers of the state um, to then translate some of these progressive values. And I think this is an important area as we are reflecting on the legacy um, of uh, uh, O.R. Tambo. But it's also an important challenge to the current leadership um, to really reflect on whether uh, we are indeed staying true to some of those values. And this is something that's going to become increasingly important as we speak about a post-COVID economic recovery to ensure that in as much as economic diplomacy uh, forms an important part of South Africa's foreign policy orientation, but that it does not lose sight of the very important, um, you know, broader and more holistic look at uh, foreign policy, which includes some of the solidarity um, uh, issues uh, that uh, uh, Comrade Geneva was actually raising. So thank you very much for those uh, reflections. I think it really is much appreciated. I think also what's important in, 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 in her remarks is that she also mentioned the important role of other non-state actors in enhancing um, you know, a progressive international relations and in not being so silent as to create a vacuum, um, you know, for, 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 for some of the things that we are seeing, you know, uh, pointed out in our chat group of incidences that are anti-progressive um, and, and that it, it's very important not only for 
the ANC and Alliance partners, but also for research institutions, for civil society organizations and other actors uh, to not cede uh, the progressive space. So I think very, very pertinent remarks there. Um, and that takes us very nicely to our next uh, uh, speaker, uh, who will be reflecting from the perspective of the uh, South African National uh, Civic Organization. Now, the South African National Civic Organization has as its guiding motto, uh, people-centered, people-driven. And we've been hearing upon reflections on the legacy of Or Tambo, on how even in countries where um, the ANC could not secure the support of various governments, but they were able to then secure solidarity uh, from a direct engagement with the peoples of those particular countries. So I think it will be interesting to get some reflections um, from Mr. Lucas uh, Kragaza uh, from Sanko. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Can you unmute your mic? I see that you're still muted. Okay, I think Mr. Kagaza is just struggling to unmute. Uh, I'm trying to also unmute him on my side. Um, your mic is still muted. Uh, Dr. Mtembu, uh, Mr. Kakaza did uh, explain a moment ago that he's really struggling with his network mm. uh, and that it uh, seems uh, it will be kicking him out. Okay. Uh, okay. So perhaps we, we could you know, move on and give him a chance a little bit later on. Perfect. No, thanks for that, Mika. Um, then I think whilst uh, Mr. Kakaza is sorting out his uh, connection uh, challenges, um, I think it would be good then at this stage uh, to allow, having seen sort of the flow of the conversation and of the discussion, um, to give the floor uh, to Ambassador Weli Lentapo um, to just reflect on the discussion as has happened so far but to also reflect on both the historical aspects and also some of the contemporary uh, issues uh, that are facing the ANC's international uh, relations. Ambassador Ntlapo, the floor is yours. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Pilani. Uh, I, I, I hope I'll be allowed also to switch off my uh, my, my my picture because uh, I, I'm under load shed dry and make sure that I sustain. Perfect. Uh, please, my presence please, in this. Please video. go ahead. So, if you allow me, let me first by doing that. And having done that, thank you very much to IGD for uh, bringing us together on this important day, on this on this uh, important subject. I think Ambassador Ntlapo is struggling with his connection also, colleagues. Let's, let's allow him to reconnect. Um, but as he is reconnecting, let me immediately also go and just note uh, some of the comments that have been coming in. I think the network kicked him out when he had his video on. Um, so I'm sure he'll be fine if he speaks without um, his video. So as you can see, uh, we are facing some technical issues because of connectivity, but I'm sure he will be in uh, immediately. Let me just note some of the comments that have been coming in uh, whilst uh, doing that. Um, and this is just for uh, our speakers to take note of. 
Um, some of the comments have included in the Q&A section have included, for instance, uh, an anonymous attendee said, you know, how would we characterize the contradictions between uh, the PAC and the ANC uh, regarding their international affairs? Um, another comment that has come in is why did OR not insist on himself as ANC leader in exile? And I think this touches on uh, what Mr. Msimang was also saying, just in the character of OR Tambo, but also in the humility uh, of OR Tambo. So these are just some of the comments. Uh, let me go on. There's another uh, comment, which is from Joshua. Uh, Kibirige, and this is for Mr. Msimang to note. Uh, he says, hello, this is Joshua uh, Kibirige. Uh, my question is directed to Mr. Mavusom Simang. Uh, he says also, he says, firstly, he wishes to thank uh, Mr. Msimang for all your work, and I guess of all others who are in exile within the ranks of the MK and creating conditions for solidarity. Uh, with ANC in Africa and globally. Uh, it says I should add that I'm a real fan of your daughter's literary work. Uh, what would your advice be for the ANC's foreign policy in dealing with Western Sahara, Palestine, and Cuba? So let's park those questions there and, and, and just for our panelists to take note of. And I see that Ambas Ambassador Ntlapo is back with us. Uh, without the video, which I guess is creating the challenge. So Ambassador Ntlapo, the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, we can hear you, Ambassador. Yeah, I, I had to switch over to my cell phone because as I expected, the other gadget uh, decided to disappoint me. Uh, I, I, I was just saying that uh, uh, the censor in the name of OR Tambo and uh, the internationalism uh, of the African National Congress, which he so aptly represented and led. Uh, <clears throat> first of all, let me thank those who have uh, spoken before me, because they really covered uh, some of the critical aspects and elements that would represent uh, what O.R. Tam was all about and what his leadership uh, contributed towards uh, further development of the internationalism of the African National Congress, which, as you had rightly stated, uh, goes back to 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 Pixliga Sam uh, right through to uh, the African claims uh, uh, and the Freedom Charter, where very clearly the foundations of the international uh, policies of the ANC was rooted. Uh, and particularly uh, uh, its firm foundation uh, and commitment to the freedom of the African people and the African continent. And I think it's one of the things that we, we should not miss. But let, let me also say that uh, from what Fosom Simang has said, uh, and correctly so, uh, the affiliation of the ANC to a number of organizations uh, facilitated our engagement of different forces that were participating within the international progressive world uh, to confront the challenges of colonialism and imperialism. And of course, the struggle against apartheid was located uh, in those processes and struggles and were able to mobilize uh, those people in support of our struggle but also to contribute towards supporting the struggles of other people, which was a very fundamental issue, and particularly for Oliver Tambo. 
uh, he would not at any moment speak without reminding audiences who are gathering and discussing the question of apartheid in South Africa, uh, that our struggle is intertwined with the struggles of the people of Namibia, struggle of the peoples of Zimbabwe, struggles of the people of Sahawari, and indeed the people of Palestine. Uh, there would be never a statement without him uh, making that connection and reference and mobilizing uh, indeed for the same uh, support uh, to be given to those struggles. Uh, that was one thing uh, that was outstanding about OR. Uh, his sense of solidarity with other people who are struggling. Uh, uh, that is number one, one point I wanted to mention. But the, the, the organizations that we were affiliated to in which we had people uh, operating within those organizations, uh, seconded by the African National Congress amongst others, was the World Federation of Democratic Youth, the Pan-African Youth Movement, the World International Federation of Women, the World Federation of Trade Unions, which was a SACTU, was affiliated, the African, the Asian Africa Up People Solidarity Organization, the World Peace Council, all Africa Students Union and the International Unions of Students, the Pan African Youth Movement, the Pan African Women's Organization, uh, the United Nations as an observer and the Organization of African Unity. Now, in all of these organizations, you had ANC representation. And all our comrades in these organizations made sure that they mobilize and use the structures of those organizations and their mandates and their support base to mobilize for the struggle against apartheid and in support of the African National Congress, and in particular also the struggles in the region. Uh, so in every conference, in all conferences, uh, ANC uh, people will be representing these organizations and speaking on behalf of the ANC, of these organizations, uh, uh, but uh, clearly being guided by the policies of the African National Congress. Uh, uh, that, that's one part. Two, uh, I would also want to underscore that uh, Comrade OR's commitment to uh, solidarity with other people who are struggling was not just in his statements uh, and, uh, and, and support in international conferences, but he actually visited on site. Several times he did go to Tindif to visit the Polisario Front and interacted with his leadership and cadres on the ground. I know also that he did go to Beirut when Beirut was under siege uh, and was there with uh, Comrade Arafat when Beirut was being bombarded uh, in the bunkers. Uh, it, it, it was that kind of person. Uh, who did not just uh, believe in, uh, uh, in words of expression of solidarity, but directly participated and made sure that he is physically present even when danger was there. But he was not afraid to take decisions, uh, even in support uh, of other countries and solidarity uh, with our sister liberation movements. When the When, when Frelimo was under pressure and signed in Komati Accord, the main defender of Frelimo and the circumstances under which they found themselves having to sign in Komati Accord was Oliver Tam, because he understood the nature of the pressure that they were under. And he engaged the leadership of Frelimo and educated all of us about the importance of understanding setback that we suffered as it may have been, why it was important to maintain 
sympathy and solidarity with the people of Mozambique. Uh, and it is that kind of spirit that led, amongst other things, when in Arusha a meeting was called to discuss uh, the question of command. Oliver Tambo was the first to define Samora Marshall in that meeting of the frontline states, which actually led towards the need for defining a position by the frontline states for South Africa. Uh, which is the process that led towards the format, the processes that led towards the Harare Declaration. But even when Angola was under siege, under pressure from the apartheid regime and the international community that had begun to deal with the issue of Angola and trying to find a solution to the problem of Angola. And when the regime made a condition to accept in Cairo the proposals that were being made for those discussions to be taken forward, that the ANC must leave Angola, Oliver Tambo did not hesitate. on freedom and liberation and that we could relocate somewhere and be able to continue uh, dismantling everything that we had in Angola to start from scratch in Uganda, for instance, amongst other things, and went back to Tanzania. That is a kind of decisiveness uh, in support of the struggles of other people in practical terms. But say that when it comes to the solidarity movement, the anti apartheid movement, I, I had my own personal experience traveling with him. Uh, that he would pay attention to all, all the issues and questions that they had about South Africa. A whole range of them will have meetings to the youth try to understand what they want to know, what is it that you are able to contribute and be able to answer their questions. Do they move the women with lawyers, with women? It's uh, it's really proving difficult. Huh? Yeah, the last uh, part I think is 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 I think we we we've been able to get. In fact, I think it's it's now uh, kicked him out uh, his network. But I think we 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 were able to get quite a good uh, understanding of some of his key inputs and just sort of characterizing um, the late O R Tambo, but also. Um, some of the contemporary challenges. Ambassador Ntlapo, I see that you are back. Um, we just... Yeah, I, the, the, I don't know. Now it's perfect. The last, maybe um, I think the last two, three minutes, we, we, we lost you there. I think the network is, 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 a, is an issue now. Are you still there, Ambassador Ntapo? Oh, 
Okay, I think for now, whilst uh, Ambassador Ntlapo is having is having uh, issues with the connectivity, um, let us see if um, let me note also another question for the panelists that's come in the chat group. <laughs> Ambassador, I think that the line is really not good now. Yeah, I think the line is 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 getting worse. So I think at this point, let me acknowledge another comment in the chat, which is uh, from uh, Ashraf Patel, who says, "Dear esteemed colleagues, in your view, how would uh, Comrade yes, Or?" It says, "How would Comrade Or Tambo characterize the global balance of power?" Sure. I think, Ambassador, what we'll do is we'll take uh, 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 some questions and then see if your network improves, because I think that last part that you wanted to touch on is where we, we, we've been struggling to hear you. So Ashraf says, how would OR... Yeah, he says, I've not... Okay. Okay, no, that's fine, Ambassador. I think let, let, let's give it a few minutes and see if 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 the network improves. So he says, how would OR Tambo characterize the global balance of power and shortcoming of global platforms and how current uh, administration should engage in solidarity with the developing South? So that's another uh, 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 comment, I think, well, for our panelists to note. Um, let me see if Mr. Pagaza, Mr. Pagaza, is your network uh, fine now? Uh, can you unmute yourself and let's maybe just test your audio? Um, then we'll see whether we just take that first round of questions. Mr. Pagaza at Sanko. Okay, I think he might also still be struggling. So let's take colleagues maybe that first round, I think, of, um, of, 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 of questions. Uh, let's just, you know, and, and, and then hopefully I think uh, Ambassador Ntlapo will, uh, his connection will be back at least for some of the final remarks uh, from our various uh, uh, speakers. Um, the first question, let's direct it maybe to Mr. Msimang, uh, which uh, the question comes from Joshua uh, Gibirige. And he's basically asking your advice on uh, or to the ANC's foreign policy in dealing with uh, questions of Western Sahara, Palestine, and Cuba. So it's basically seeking your advice on the contemporary issues of Western Sahara, Palestine, and, and, and Cuba. And having listened to, to that rich input uh, from the past, how could the ANC uh, uh, play a role, both party, but also in government with regards to those, uh, 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 those three struggles? Dr. Mtembu, Mr. Takaza is back. Is he back? Yes. Is all your fine? Yeah. Mr. Takaza? I see he's unmuted. Uh, let's see if his audio is fine. Mr. Kagaza? Okay. Let's test your audio. No, I think he's, he's struggling. I think the connection is not good from his side. All right. Yeah. So maybe let's proceed with the, with the, with the questions. And then we can, and then we can ask him uh, to come back. I think at the end, uh, hope hoping that the connection uh, comes back, uh, Mr. Msimang. Um, so you heard the question that was directed uh, to you. Yeah, thank you very very much, uh, 
Uh, it is a pity. I don't know if you might not be able to reach the two uh, colleagues uh, on their cell phones because this is really disrupting everything now. You otherwise have a wonderful discussion going on here. Mm, yes. Really? I see Ambassador Ntlapo is back. So I think after your input, we'll see uh, what, what, uh, what his situation is. Thank you very much. On the issue of uh, um, Western Sahrawi, um, the Sahrawi Republic, and, 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 and uh, I think it's at Cuba, and uh, uh, which is the other one, in Palestine. I wish uh, Ambassador Nchapo was available because I think he would be most uh, suited, most uh, to, to responding to this. He's very current uh, in what's going on. Suffice to say that, uh, you know, Joslov, we used to talk about uh, uh, flexibility of policies, but you could never be flexible about principles. On principles, you cannot be. Sarawi uh, must, we must maintain the solidarity uh, with the people of uh, the Sarawi Republic. I, I hope it's going on. That's why I'm a bit uh, apologetic, uh, ap apologetic about not being very off fair with the latest real current uh, trends. Trends, but we, we have an obligation. We have an absolute duty to stand in solidarity with the people of uh, the Sahrawi Republic against the colonialism, the trepidation, uh, the, the, it's aggressive. Morocco is aggressive. It's very disappointing to see that they've been admitted to the AU uh, while the Sahrawi Republic uh, position uh, problem has not been solved. It's, 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 it's shameful. It's not different from seeing what happens with an ambassador with a, a country uh, being visited by Israel to um, to tell an African country to include a, an item on the agenda on Palestine, which is completely against the positions that have been taken by the AU. We are, in summary, uh, experiencing a lot of uh, problems internationally, um, in that um, the imperialist countries are very, very aggressive in trying to um, get uh, Africa to, to toe their line. Um, and, and the effort is ceaseless. They do it all the time. Uh, they succeed uh, in the short term, but one always hopes that uh, uh, Africa will prevail uh, in the end. So short question really is that we cannot and I say we cannot be seen to be taking positions that are hostile, that are inimical to the interests of the people of the Sahrawi Republic, of Cuba. I think uh, there haven't been many problems there, and also of Palestine. Uh, you are seeing this, this South, South Africa, international relations, that's where you are again, really needs to take a principled position and speak aggressively, very forcefully against positions that are being taken um, that undermine the solidarity, but first of all, the interests of the people who, um, of, of uh, these three uh, countries. Um, I, I hope uh, Ambassador Ntlapo is listening and might brief us on exactly what is going on, but uh, we, have no, we have no option but to continue the work that OR and other, and other leaders of the ANC um, have taken in solidarity with people who, like us, were oppressed by oppress were, were, were under oppressive regimes. Africa stood with us. They said they would never be free until the last territory in Africa was free. Uh, I think we should continue on that stance and act uh, accordingly. Uh, briefly, that I see the other question, but perhaps. Uh, they cannot be attended to later. I did want to talk on the Mandela, sorry, on the ANC, um, um, uh, OR not wanting to be a leader. I, I think it's to, it speaks to his humility, but as soon as Robben Island, where the leadership was, 
uh, was alerted to the problem, um, uh, they then communicated. I think Matt Maharaj would be very helpful here, indicating that they thought he should accept the position of president, uh, even as it would be um, uh, conferred on him in exile conditions. And he then did that. And uh, from then things uh, went, uh, went, went well. Uh, he did become the president, uh, accept the title of president of the ANC. Um, but his humility again would be shown in, for instance, him answering questions from a journalist in Addis Ababa who said, Mandela is really the leader of the ANC is in prison. Uh, what is your own position? And gave a classical answer, he said, yes, Mandela and so many others are our leaders. Uh, and our duty is to fight for their liberation, um, freedom from prison. Uh, in other words, he was just saying so unimportant that you should be talking about a single individual who is, is this the leader or not the leader. So, sure. thank you. Oh, thank you very much uh, for that. Um, I see Ambassador Ntlapo is back. Uh, Ambassador, we just lost the last um, part that you had been uh, 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 touching on. You were just about to to sort of give a wrap of, of your final input, and then we and then the sound just went bad. Um, so let me hand the floor back uh, to you. Yeah, no, 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 no uh, I, I was uh, talking about uh, his approach uh, towards uh, different circumstances whenever he had to mobilize the constituencies that were committed to the struggle against apartheid. I was mentioning the UN, uh, that even at the UN, he skillfully would deal with the issue of South Africa whenever he's given the opportunity to do so, particularly in the special committee against apartheid, and traverse the path that would unite everybody against the apartheid regime, including those who had a strong, very strong relations with the apartheid regime. You know, Comrade O'R was a very good listener. When Chester Crocker came from Namibia and uh, was disappointed about the implementation of Resolution 435 uh, and passed through Lusaka and uh, indicated how he was treated there. And when he went to London and met with O'R, he reported to him his experience and his advice was that don't, don't follow resolution 435 kind of solution for South Africa because the United Nations is not going to be able to deliver from what he had seen. That's Chess Crocker, uh, who was Assistant Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs uh, under the Reagan administration. And he took his advice. And the ANC they took note of what he was saying. I'm saying the Harari Declaration, amongst other things, was informed exactly by that kind of position, that understanding the limitations of the United Nations because of the Security Council and its composition, that it is better to mobilize the African continent, mobilize our people, mobilize the region in particular, and take the matter to the United Nations General Assembly for a resolution on South Africa, which led to a resolution uh, in Congress, uh, passed by Congress in defiance of a position that was taken by Ronald Reagan and uh, instituted a whole range of sanctions against the apartheid regime, cutting those links. And following that, he started, and also following that advice and engagement that Chet Crocker had done with the Brits, he followed up with Margaret Thatcher and, he, and her government and won them over at least uh, to a position where they would soften uh, their attitude uh, 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 towards uh, the African National Congress. Uh, he could not have won them over of course, uh, uh, away from uh, some of the positions that they were taking because they thought we were puppets of the Soviet Union uh, and therefore communist 
uh, dominated and led and that uh, 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 they would not on an ideological position associate themselves with the ANC. But it did the same thing with the OAU. The first meeting of the OAU I attended was in 1979 in Liberia as part of his delegation. But the main issue in that summit was about Zimbabwe because Lancaster House was taking place and an issue of Zimbabwe was going to be discussed at the OAU and immediately that after at the Commonwealth in Lusaka where uh, the decision, unfortunately, is the one that was taken, which created some problems in Lancaster House. It's an issue for another day, but I'm saying, even in his contribution, it was more about Zimbabwe and how South Africa is linked to that process and why South Africa would benefit and the stand that South Africa needs, that the OAU needs to take in support of the struggle in Zimbabwe. But one of the other things that was his humility, when we arrived at the airport uh, in Liberia, in Monrovia, we had in the plane a delegation from Lesotho and from the Seychelles, led by their prime minister, Alberini and uh, Yabua Jonathan. And when you got off the plane, the protocol, the new OR, they didn't know the other two, but he stepped back because they were heads of state and he was able to introduce them. And he said, these are heads of state. I will go in after them. And they then took the rightful place in terms of uh, the protocol that was supposed to have been provided. He did not take advantage of the fact that he was known. He humbled himself because he understood who they were, what they stood for, and what it would represent for South Africa. But let me end up on a very light note uh, about uh, or, uh, which Mavuso um, Simang has said. All of you, I'm sure you are aware that OR was a teacher. Now, I, I was a deputy editor of the Chava, and most of the time we would record his speeches, we would try, try to translate and transcribe them. But whenever any transcription uh, has been done and sent to him, it will come back bleeding with a red pen, full stops and commas shifted. In the end, you wouldn't know where to start because the teacher in him took over and he was correcting just about everything. But in a very, very nudging and polite manner, uh, educating, and if you had to argue, he'll then respond and in fact clarify. I remember on the statement in 1979, January 8th statement, there was a question of Isandra. It sounded in the tape that we had as him saying, sharpen the spear. And that's what we transcribed. And we gave it back to him, despite the other corrections that he had done. And then he said, no, but uh, 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 there is a question here. If I say shorten the spear, it means exactly that because that's the tactic that Chaga used. And that's what contributed towards the victory of the Sandwana. You can't go to, where, to war with a spear that is not sharpened. So I can't say sharpen the spear. We said, okay, then sharpen and shorten. Said, no, no. I'm talking about the tactics. We're talking here about Isandra. So I, I, I'm saying that he was quite sensitive uh, to anything, but we'll correct you in a manner in which he'll engage you. And in the end, you'll understand exactly from where he comes from. But he was such a humble person that even in his home, and some of us have experienced that, uh, he will serve food and thereafter wash the dishes himself because he missed family life. But at the same time, when he was in his house, when he would talk to us, he would be missed, missing his larger family in the camps and everywhere in Lusaka. And of course, the South African people. Thank you very much.
Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, I'm just noting also time that we are moving towards wrapping up. So what I would like to do is to ask uh, Mika to just select a few comments uh, in the, in the Q&A and in the chat and just read them out um, or summarize them and then allow all of the speakers um, to just give their concluding remarks. Uh, they can, if they want, respond to some of the questions that are out there, um, but then to also keep that in mind in their concluding remarks. So let me ask Mika to just uh, uh, come in and just read out a few of the comments. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ntembu. Uh, among some of the questions that uh, stand out, uh, the very first one that you mentioned earlier, how would you characterize the contradictions between the PAC and ANC regarding their international affairs? Uh, another of um, a particular note um, is, on, is on the matter of xenophobia, uh, where here. How are you by uh, Mr. Um, Ms., uh, or Mr. Njoki Wamai? How are you fighting Afrophobia in this country against other Africans if this is internationalism? Uh, there's another by um, uh, 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 Mr. Ashraf. Mr. Ashraf Patel, um, uh, on this is a dear esteemed colleagues, in your view, how would you, co how would Comrade Oar Tambo characterize the global balance of power and shortcomings of global platforms and how current administration should engage in the solidarity with the developing South? Um, and lastly, you know, uh, maybe we could, you know, touch on the, um, Mr. Zweledinga Jordan's you know, comment uh, saying OR's dialogue with uh, Chester Crocker had nothing to do with OR's initiative regarding the Harare Declaration. OR had long ago understood that the solution must be among South Africans and as far as possible, exclude especially Western powers. Uh, there's um, another comment Um, by uh, uh, Francesca Fons, and frankly, quite stunned on how human failure, you know, to be how human failure to species, speciehood. Okay. Not sure exactly what that means. We are supposed to be intelligent upon you know this living planet after, uh, and after eons, we are still directed and torn regarding race, ethnicity, and religion. We as human, as a human race uh, or species, are indeed in need of effect, effective leadership uh, to the likes of uh, late Comrade Oa Tambu. It is almost unfathomable. Um, yeah, but those are you know some of the comments that Dr. Mtembu uh, picked up in the Q and A uh, and the, the the chat function. Oh, excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Mika. Um, so with that, uh, colleagues, let me just ask uh, all our uh, panelists to just have their final remarks, uh, taking cognizant of, of, of some of the comments that have come in. Um, and first up, I would ask Mr. Mavusom Simam to just give his uh, final input and concluding uh, remarks. Thank you very much. Again, um, I think it's really as a badge of honor that I was invited to participate in this. I'll address the question, some of the questions. Um, my summary of the meeting is that it's gone off wonderfully well. The quality of uh, the presentations of the, the content of the discussion is worthy of continuation all the time. So we, I congratulate you all. Very quickly, the, the, the PAC and the ANC, you know, OR Tambo, among other things, is distinguished by having had the ability to keep the, the ANC united for all the 30 years that it was in exile. 
it remained one A and C. We did have a glitch sometimes. Um, at one time, uh, eight members were expelled, uh, but really that was not a split in the organization. I would really like to respectfully also refer to how he would answer questions on unity with the PAC. The PAC didn't have the good fortune of having an Oliver Tambo as its leader. Maybe it was banned too soon after its formation in 1958, I think. Uh, and so had not had, and I say this respectfully, the opportunity to develop uh, um, a leadership uh, that had been tested in, in, in the experience uh, of uh, uh, working with the people uh, for, for a long period of time. When Owar was asked this question about the ANC and PAC unity, he said, unity was very important, but it must be built in South Africa we cannot build it outside uh, for very many reasons, among which, and I'm still not gloating about this, uh, we don't quite know which of the eight PACs you'd like us to unite with. This was at, uh, at um, I think it was in uh, Kampala at the OAU, I may be making a mistake. They had, due to, their, to some misfortune of leadership, there were indeed, there was a PAC in, uh, recognized by the AU in Tanzania. There was another in Kinshasa, another one in New York and so on. So he, he said, which piece do you want us to unite with? All these people are leaders who were elected by their people at home. But the importance of unity cannot be overestimated. Let's find and make it, build it. Uh, back in the battlefield in South Africa. That, that's really how I would respond to that question. The uh, issue of um, oof, um, the balance. What is what is saying? Uh, the balance of uh, the balance of global power. So I I I I defer to uh, to uh, Ambassador. Uh, to deal with that. I, I'm not quite sure how to, to handle it, but the balance, the global balance of power, uh, you know, the, there is a capitalist system of governance in the world and uh, a socialist one, which uh, went into some kind of serious retreat with the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, so there is, one global power, so to speak, although China has emerged also as a, a very important nation. So I don't know what the balance is now. Relations between uh, China and uh, Russia, which is what it is now, there's no Soviet Union, are not any different from the relations that uh, China has with uh, the United States. And, uh, so the, the balance right now, as I see it, is that uh, you have an America which is also experiencing its own, um, uh, it's beginning to have its own experiences about being imperialist and getting into places like uh, uh, Iraq, as they did, and be humiliated when they discover that uh, uh, in fact, intervention was not going to sort out the problems. There were no weapons of war, mass, mass, sort of mass destruction. You have uh, this leading power in the world now being humiliated in uh, Afghanistan, having spent trillions of dollars in trying to prop up uh, uh, governments there that were not popular. And uh, at a cost of, uh, I think at least, uh, 25,000 uh, American lives as more, more than 10 times that number for others. Um, so I don't know, they may remain a power, but I don't think their influence is as much as would be, uh, um, uh, would be proportional to the 
demise of the Soviet Union. But I'll really defer to better persons to, to talk on this. Uh, and yeah, I, I thank you very much for allowing me uh, to participate in this thing. I did say that on uh, ORs, um, yeah, I've, I've dealt with OR not wanting to accept the uh, leadership of the NC until there was clearance from his peers. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Msimang. And I do hope that this uh, uh, conversation does continue both uh, formally, but also informally, because I think we can also uh, gain a lot in reflecting uh, with the likes of yourself and uh, fellow panelists uh, on contemporary international relations issues and drawing uh, from some of those historical insights. So we've really appreciated your own insights um, in this discussion. Um, let me ask Mr. Bongani Masugu uh, to then also give uh, just some of his uh, closing remarks and uh, reflections. Yeah, no, thank you very much uh, once again, uh, Comrade uh, Dr. Pilani and the uh, team, and to all the veterans who have shared very valuable insights and to all the comrades who are here. Uh, just two things on our side, uh, as Kosatu, that we want to emphasize. The first one is that it might be helpful that we use the experiences, the rich history, to be able to locate ourselves in the current conjuncture in the present circumstances. There is a new SADAC. There is a new Southern Africa that is imaging. We might be, uh, we, we might have been able to travel the journey before, but the journey is changing now. There's a new ball game in the, in the room. The youth is rejecting the current setup of circumstances in most of our instances. And we can't be silent and keep hoping that the past will be replayed. There's a new game together. So it means that if we are to be alive to the reality of today, Surely we can't talk about international solidarity and international balance of forces outside answering the question, what's happening in Swatil? We can't talk about international balance of forces as if it's about overseas without answering the question, what has happened in Zambia? What are the, what are the developments in Zambia today? We can't talk about international balance of forces far away without answering the question, where are we in the suit? The rich in Southern Africa is our home base. And one thing that the Cubans have taught us, you can be as international as much as possible, but your home ground is the base and the rear base. Imperialism, if it wants to undermine you, it won't undermine you far. It will come here. So the reality is that the international policy of the ANC, the international policy of the Alliance must know that the home ground is Southern Africa. It is Zimbabwe, it is Zambia, it is Malawi, it is Swaziland, it's wherever, and we must be engaged with it and not hope and imagine that things will move in a different direction. I always wonder when I look at how the Americans, at how the Danish, at how the EU, and now the British, or the British, of course, have always been part of the EU, are engaged in each of these countries. Wherever I go, I find them directly engaged and I ask, how is it that in our region, we are foreigners? I mean, we are not engaged with, our, with the issues of our region. So I want, one of the things that we want to suggest, comrades, is that the movement must consider the ideas about the International Solidarity Forum, internationalism, and even we're even talking yesterday with the comrades in Zimbabwe who are in the Royal Congress about the revival of a Southern African solidarity movement along the lines of the Sao Paulo Forum a movement that is alive, that is engaged with what's happening in Mozambique and Angola today. How we, do we intervene and how does the youth link with the structures of the past so that we don't hope that the past will reinvent itself. We engage ourselves and say to the youth and engage the youth about what kind of future we're building in Southern Africa, not necessarily anywhere else, so that you can be able to move together. With those words, comrades, we want to be able to thank the IGT for this eye-opening and engaging session and be able to answer the question, including, I was looking at the truck drivers uh, yesterday. We had a lengthy discussion about the truck drivers on the entry and the messages and, and, and nationally and the dynamics. What, what is happening? 
So that should be able to help us answer questions that are practical so that, as Marxists say, the structure and the truth is concrete. The abstract at some point melts into thin air because the concrete must be the basis of our structure. Thank you very much, uh, comrades, and all the best. Thank you very much uh, for that. And I think uh, very relevant in also linking it to contemporary issues. And, and, and when we're conceptualizing uh, progressive international relations, when we're conceptualizing South Africa in the world, to not forget that uh, Southern Africa is essentially our home ground. Um, and with that, let me ask uh, Ms. Uh, Fori uh, to come in with her closing remarks. And I've acknowledged that uh, Mr. Msimang also has uh, his hands up. Um, I've acknowledged your hands, sir. Um, thank you, Chairperson. Um, once again, thank you to all who arranged this platform. Uh, it is also nice to see that there are many international experts who are participants in the seminar, and it would have been good to hear more of their views. Just to expand on the question of the international balance of forces, there is an argument that we are living in a multipolar world and that the USA is losing hegemony at an international level. The reality, though, is that the USA and its allies continue to dominate where it matters. Comrade Ntsimang uh, stated earlier that imperialist countries are aggressive in trying to get Africa to toe the line, including, and this is my addition, including in undermining the sovereignty of countries and supporting undemocratic regime change. Um, the US continues to enforce sanctions against countries like Cuba and Venezuela, regardless of the position of the UN and its organs. The apartheid Israeli regime unabatedly continues to harass and detain Palestinians and to encroach on Palestinian and Syrian land. And um, so one has to question really whether the hegemony of the USA is indeed descending. We are hopeful, though, in that what we are seeing is a realignment of progressive entities, as expressed in the joint statements that emerged from the United Nations General Council against unilateralism and the abuse of sanctions. We are also seeing a reassertion of African unity, interestingly, as championed by academics. And more, um, we're also witnessing more substantive moves as gov at the government-to-government -government level in advancing intra-Africa trade. But indeed, as Comrade Masuku has emphasized, it is, it's incumbent upon us to be engaged from also with developments that's happening on our doorstep, with developments in Southern Africa, including the situation in Swaziland. The onus is on us as a liberation movement to ensure that we reassert our historical values of internationalism and inter international solidarity much more assertively. Uh, there was a comment that we, we need leaders of the caliber of Comrade Owar Tambo, and that is very much true, but we cannot defer responsibility. If there is a leadership vacuum, it is incumbent upon us to fill that vacuum. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. And thank you again for your participation. I think also, you know, this has really added uh, to a very rich discussion and a discussion that uh, should not stop here. But I think we should see this discussion today as the start of a continuous conversation uh, on the ANC's international relations, the role of the Alliance partners in international relations, uh, but also the role of the broader uh, progressive organizations within international relations. And I think we should see this conversation as, as, as a catalyst towards filling a void uh, where perhaps progressive uh, thinkers and, 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 and those uh, and practitioners have perhaps seeded uh, some of that. And hence we see in the comments, you know, great worry about uh, incidences of xenophobia, uh, but also just some of the dynamics within our immediate uh, region. 
and to see what role not only government uh, can play, but what role for political parties, trade unions, and other uh, actors. Uh, the person who will have the last word is Ambassador Ntlapo, but uh, I see that um, Mr. Msimang uh, may have wanted to just uh, have another minute to just complete a point. Mr. Msimang, is that correct? I had, but I wanted to lower my hand because it's a very difficult question. Okay. But I don't want to leave it hanging just like that. The issue of xenophobia, I think we risk losing our people at a time when unemployment is very, we all know how difficult things are in South Africa. And so the high levels of un unemployment emotionally uh, get associated with um, the, the, the visibility of people from other countries, and it would mostly, almost always be African people. So our hate trait is an Afrophobia rather than a xenophobia broadly, because we don't even know how many other white people are in this country from different uh, places. It, it is an issue that has a lot to do with pressure for employment and a perception that the jobs uh, go to uh, foreigners. We do need to find a solution to this. Um, part of the problem is that we, it's many problems. One of them is that a lot of the people who are here uh, are here illegally, so-called undocumented. Now, it is important for our government to be able to uh, act uh, and, and reduce this, um, this category of people. Uh, an undocumented person is, is, when they commit a crime or do anything, it's not easy to trace. An undocumented person, if they were to get a job, you can't really quite enumerate that. So that phenomenon everybody must uh, condemn. Yes. The, 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 it, it happens so much because we are corrupt in our country. I cannot see how anybody would allocate a house to a person who has no documents. It's only because this South African has been given money by the person who is looking for a house or an ID or things like that. So we, we need to deal with this problem at very different levels, but there is always a risk in being hostile to fellow Africans. And I think the leadership of the organization must do a little better than what we have heard sometimes where <clears throat> our leaders in a particular province would say, we're not going to govern this country uh, with criminals, referring to people who had committed a crime or coming from, uh, especially if these criminals are foreigners. So they can live with criminals if they're local um, criminals, but if if it's the foreigners who do that, that, that is really what people mean mean by xenophobia. What we ought to be doing as a leadership is to have these discussions. Uh, we did not actually even explain sufficiently to our people, a lot of whom are young now, who don't know the role that was played by these countries with very scanty resources in making sure that we. Uh, uh, obtained uh, our, our freedom. In fact, it's always amazing how the countries in their time of fighting their struggles against colonialism always looked to South Africa and to the ANC as their model for, for the struggle. You had the ANC of Zimbabwe, as Rhodesia at the time, ANC of Zambia, ANC of Mozambique, these are people who have looked in solidarity to us uh, as uh, the models for how to, certainly in the early ages, in stages of their fight, fighting for, for freedom. So we are actually destroying a brand by uncritically uh, cursing anybody who comes into South Africa because they are not South African. It's a serious educational challenge that we need to impart to our people. It's also being sensitive and making sure that we do not leave our people behind and theoretically talk about how the people assisted, assisted us with liberation. It's a serious, serious challenge, but again, 
the principle cannot be sacrificed. You cannot take a hostile position to people who are here uh, simply because things are difficult. Uh, they are here, those who come here legally because of the international obligations that we have uh, undertaken in terms of assisting uh, asylum seekers, etc. But it's, it's not an easy one. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think it was really quite important um, to address this particular issue because I think not addressing it creates a vacuum for um, you know, very hostile positions that we're seeing not only on social media, but even playing themselves out in society. And, and, and the question is how then do we move towards a a progressive manner of actually tackling uh, this particular issue, both at home in South Africa, but also how can we use our international relations to also um, address some of the, uh, you know, some of the core reasons of why people are being forced to move out of their countries. And, and, and I think this needs um, uh, progressive actors, both inside the state, but outside the state, to really uh, not sacrifice uh, principle and therefore to con construct actions that are in line with uh, the principle. It's a difficult one, but I think it's really, really important. Um, otherwise, sort of, uh, you know, sticking our necks in the sand uh, will just seed that space for very negative uh, thinking on this particular issue. So thank you for that, Mr. Msimang. Um, and then colleagues, just for the final uh, remarks, I wish to then ask Ambassador Ntlapo um, to just give his final input. Yeah, yeah, yeah. thanks, Pilane. Hmm. Ambassador, uh, your audio is gone. Okay, that's unfortunate. I think the audio is just uh, struggling. It must again just be a connectivity issue. Um, that okay. Ambassador. No, no. Ah, there I, you I don't know. Go ahead. No, no. Go I was ahead. saying that uh, 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 he is correct uh, uh, in asserting that uh, the engagement to Chad Crock has nothing to do with the initiative on the RR declaration. I have indicated very clearly earlier that in response to the signing of the Nkomati Accord, Nyerere convened a meeting of the frontline states in uh, Russia, where the matter was on the agenda. It was exclusively to discuss that. And in the process, it was agreed in the end from the explanation that Samora gave and every discussion that took place that there is a lack of a common vision and a common position in the region in terms of what the plan is for South Africa, as was the case with the resolution 45, for instance, which is a question that everybody had been asking. And Comrade O'R was then asked to take the lead in developing that vision for the continent uh, to be behind it so that nobody has any problem in determining what actually should be the position in as far as South Africa is concerned, because they were engaging the regime differently and at different levels. Uh, the point that I was making about Chad Crocker was in relation to the role of the Security Council in passing a resolution that might bind the international community in supporting a process that will be managed through the United Nations for South Africa because 
of the experience of what happened in Namibia with Resolution 435. And I punctuated that by saying, OR was a very good listener. He listened to that. I said he was a good listener and he listened to that. I didn't say he was motivated by it. I think I need to make myself very clear on that one. And he never invited the imperialist countries, Western countries, to participate in the solution to our problem. He involved the people of those countries to put pressure on their governments to cut their legs with apartheid regime. And I think that difference must be quite clear so that there is no confusion. Excellent. No, thank you very much, Ambassador. Um, and I think this has really been quite a rich uh, conversation. And as you can see, uh, colleagues, we've gone over time, but I think this also just shows, I think, the wealth of, of, of knowledge and insights that we have been having in this particular discussion. And again, what I'll emphasize is that let's look at this as the first one but it will be accompanied by others, um, which some of them will be open dialogues as today's has been, but others will also be through a closed format Chatham House rules. And, and, and this will continue the conversation and sort of giving a, a further spotlight on the ANC's international relations. And it comes at an opportune time, uh, especially moving forward uh, towards the next uh, National General um, uh, Council, uh, the National General Council of the ANC. So where they will be reflecting, I guess, on the implementation of some of the policies related to international relations. So let's see this as a catalyst for further engagement on the ANC's international relations. And with those remarks, colleagues, let me just thank again our speakers, thank you for making uh, your, uh, yourselves available in a very busy time uh, for your respective organizations. Um, and also thank you for the insights that you've provided um, today, but the conversation will certainly continue. Thank you, colleagues. Thank you and bye-bye. <laughs>